Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Sohegan School Board meeting on March 7th at 6 p.m. We're opening up with the public hearing. Um, so I need a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. A second. Second. And since we're five of us are here, we just need to um, we can just do a vote, a vote here since no one's online. So all those in favor, welcome uh, to public aye. hearing. Aye. Aye. All right. That's all five of us. Um, all right. So uh, Amy, sure. would you mind speaking to? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so I believe that you all have in your board packet the uh, memo regarding unanticipated revenue um, and the chart that details yeah. all of the specific amounts. Um, so we we started doing this uh, last sure. year, where we have this public hearing to accept any unanticipated revenue, so that we are able to expend those funds um, as as on necessary items um, that are deemed appropriate by administration um, and other staff. So these are, uh, the, the reason we need to do this is because the uh, school district budgets operate on a gross budgeting basis. So you're not allowed to spend any funds above and beyond um, what, the, um, what has been approved. Um, in terms of appropriations and the offsetting revenues. So uh, most of the grants that are in this are, um, you can see listed, we have IDEA and the title grants. Um, there's some ESSER, there's a pre-engineering grant, the Spalding Trust um, Fund, Saber Startup, and um, some funds for Health Trust Wellness Coordinator. We also have supply chain grant money that has come in over the last few years. Um, those funds are, they're, they're a bit specific. They can only be used on uh, perishables, so fresh produce mainly and milk. So we do use them to offset food costs, but we can't just apply them to our, um, uh, to a bottom line deficit. But we do want to be able to have the ability to, um, to use those funds to offset uh, food costs and want to uh, accept those as part of the revenue budget. Um, so we're just looking for the board to um, accept these funds so that we can utilize them um, throughout the year. Great, thank you. And the motions we'll make in our actual meeting session. So yep. right now is just the public hearing to see if any, there are any comments. Yep. And then the, the other is just a cleanup. Um, this information was presented to you several times and for some reason there was not a board motion to accept, um, to approve the withdrawal of funds for capital needs project. Uh, I don't know why it was omitted, but it was omitted in error. So we're just trying to close the transaction with the trustees of the trust funds. So we need to show that we have um, had a public hearing and that the board um, held that hearing and approved the withdrawal of the funds. We had the meeting that we talked about money for the skylights, but we've never actually motioned to take money yeah. or... You actually did approve. Did. You approved, but we didn't. it wasn't in the minute of the public hearing. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. technicality. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So now <laughs> we'll be in a minute. So, yeah. 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 Well, the design and we can actually buy these things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So any, any questions? Anyone have questions? So I have a question yeah. about it. This is good news. We're oh. receiving more grants than we anticipated. That's yep. yay. Okay. Yep. And it's, the total is a little bit more than the difference between our default budget calculation and our proposed budget. So I'm wondering, um, assuming we accept these, which I imagine we will, uh, if we should do a press release to say that we have received additional funds and unanticipated revenue, and um, we're happy to offset our uh, Cost for our proposed budget with with these additional funds. You have to be careful because of supplanting. Because of so, supplanting, so the, the, like the IDEA, the IDEA Title One to all of those, they actually have to up the budget because those are grants to support students. Okay. So we can't 
spend the money for those grants unless you unless it's in the budget. So if it's additional revenue that came in, we also they also offset and increase the budget at the same size so they can spend the money. It's just an offset. It's an offset. So the net is zero. Offset of expenses. No. Yeah, and so it's a net, the net is actually zero. Yeah, the, 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 oh, but okay. I'm, does that make sense? Yes, <laughs> but we budget for our budget. Correct me if I'm wrong. I understand. We budget not considering revenue from any source, and then but our tax rate is set when we we have budget. We have revenue estimates in our delivery supply deck. So yeah. we're raising 20, 20, 20, 20 million. Estimated revenue was 15 or 16, so the net tax impact is the difference between the two. Yeah. So oh, this no. this is we're, you're, yeah. we're, we're mixing up the funds. So there's three okay. funds. There's the general fund, there's the food service fund, and then there's the grant fund. The grant. And this is just the grant fund. Just the grant. So it's just isolated to fund 22, um, where we have we have money that was budgeted. It was two hundred forty nine thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. We want to spend more than that if um with using these funds and we just have an offsetting revenue to that so it doesn't have any impact on on the sun fund balance so it doesn't impact the regular budget but it does allow us to do things within the grant budget that we would not otherwise have been able to do because there would have been enough to do all the projects that would be yes covered. exactly yes right because we can only spend up to the amount that is appropriated so we have right. to increase the revenue budget to match the expenses yeah. that we want to be able to do. This is not found money that we just get to give back to the taxpayers. Yeah. This is money that's that is they were they asked for the grant money so they could do specific student at work. And now that they receive more or they receive the money, we're able to expand we're able to actually do that. We are tight. We're able to either expand that work yeah. and or to the extent the work that was hoped for costs more. We've yeah, got that's how those stops student grant money work. So any unused grant money goes back to the grant grantee or the grant order. Right? Yeah, yeah, we, 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 yeah, right. we, we would go back. We would not be able to keep right? it. Typically it rolls to the next year. So you'll see several years worth of like IDEA and maybe some title grants. If we weren't able to use all of those, they roll to the next year. And then we we still want to use those. So we um, the goal is never to return our grant funds. So right, these are federal entitlements that you cannot something like like one of like Title Two A is for professional development, it's also for class size reduction. But say we lost the budget, we couldn't we couldn't pay the business teacher on Title Two. That would be supplanting a regular a cost of the local by a federal, and you can't supplant. You know, right. sell it to, it's in its own box. That's why it's mm -hmm. a separate fund. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. yeah. And the receipts all have that tally up at the end of the yeah. year. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we uh, have the audit. Yeah. Yeah. Which was why we right. separated the um the food service because that's a separate fund as well. That's right. 120. Mm -hmm. And the general budget is funded. Mm -hmm. sure well, then yeah. I guess I mean, okay, I appreciate the <laughs> explanation. What what we could maybe still do something like and uh I was going to say you can help me write it out, but we yeah. I really need Amy's help since she's going to get it wrong. Um, I, but we could, like, I could do another one of the little just updates to Facebook of what's going on and just say, as part of the point of including this, we got some additional grant money that is being used for the following. As long as the people happens. don't confuse the fact right. that this, right. this is out. separate from the general fund, yeah. but we were able yep. to use these funds to cover the costs associated with A, B, C, D, and E sure. without increasing any costs for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then I guess on that note, what we had a, we had what we thought we were going to get, I guess, or estimated. Yeah, you don't know. Because you don't know. Yeah. But then, and now more came in, so I guess with what we thought we were going to get, we had a plan of action, what we were going to use that money for. Now it's bigger, so I guess then that's the we question. What is A, B, and C? We had A, B, and C, but now we have D, E, and F. So what, yeah. so what additional actions would we take to, you know, help our students with yeah. this money, I guess, is the question. Yeah. yeah, so the different folks at the SAU sort of have, have um, managed these, these grant funds. So that would be a wider conversation, but some of these are special ed funds. So that would, comes under the special ed director. Um, the titles typically have been um, managed by the assistant superintendents. So, uh, and the ESSER as well. And so those would be those folks who um, who would do that work. What 
it, it's very regulated and we have to um, adhere to, to lots of rules. There's a whole grant management system of putting in um, the different activities and getting them approved. So for more information on that, I would say I'm not the best person to tell you what all yeah. those things are. I manage the money side, but you could have other folks at the SAU give information. And, and the other piece too is that like this revenue and this sort of thing coming in is nothing new. No. We've just not in the until last year, really when you became BA, did we start receiving this money in a public hearing yeah. and a motion before. It, it's really best practice. We just never it did it before, but it's all happening. Like, now we're doing it better way. If we met, Dana, Elizabeth, right. Christine, and I met <laughs> to write the Title II way to support uh, bringing in professional development for the writing course. The new writing course this yeah. spring, well, some early summer, I guess, early summer, we're using title funds because title fund is professional development, perfectly appropriate. So we're, we're using it to fund professional development for our teachers to develop a best practice writing course that was proven at graduation requirements. And so, so that's an example of, and there's other initiatives like in all the districts. So we're managing, oh, I think the number of grants because you can have three years at once at um, three districts. So it's, it, it's very time. We have made a concerted effort um, over the last few years to try to, to use funds and only be managing sort of the, the current year or the prior year and the current year. So um, right. to really put these dollars to work. What you're saying is time consuming when you have two years worth of funds to take it off each thing have to be in the seats have to be separated. So yeah. well, you know, but this list is a lot shorter than it was last time. So you got a lot more. <laughs> Um, well, then, I don't know, maybe that is something uh, your office could um, help us to communicate out, like, well, we're getting all these funds, and maybe just some examples of what they are used for and it why they're so and important. And the work that was done to get them yes, and how they were used. And how they are, have been used and will be used going forward. Because sure. I'm not 100% clear on okay. that. Be okay. nice. It's, it's positive. It is. It is. It's, it's, it's a great thing. So, yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, the people that take the time to write these grants do a lot of work yeah, and very detailed, and we thank them greatly for it. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Honestly, we thank them greatly for doing that work. Yeah. I mean, because it is stuff that, I mean, one, we're I'm using we're like, like, not too many platforms for work. We should not <laughs> we're not acknowledging that, you know, that work that has come in. And it is stuff that, although it doesn't change the regular budget, I assume that we've incurred these costs, they have to be paid. So if we were short on the grants, we would have to be having a talk about moving money from here to cover the shortfall, you know, if something wasn't obtained, if we had a cost that wasn't covered. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, that happens. That happens. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. you know but it's not often. Right. Um, the, the pretty the, the daily rate of teachers is pretty complicated. So yeah, yeah. so it's when you estimate it when you do agree, we don't know right. yeah. which teacher is going to show up and for how many days. So yeah. sometimes yeah. you manage it. So I think our press release could be something as simple as this district was able to acquire additional blah 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 revenue to cover blah 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 expenses of special development, this and that, that. Yeah, we can get the descriptions if you know what the one eighty two eighty and all really could be a simple. Thanks to the efforts of obtaining grants, yeah. we were able to obtain, yeah. allowing us to do these without any cost to the taxpayers. Yeah. Okay, we'll work on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I have one other inquiry. Please. I, yeah. I'll try to find it here. I, I can't, but I remember reading somewhere about one of, I don't know if it's one of these grants or something else, but where we were awarded more than we anticipated or we got something we didn't anticipate, but it was about Security that's and later. Oh, that's security. later in the yeah. regular meeting. That's yeah. not this. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll hold that. Yeah. Until that's coming. That's later. Okay. <laughs> that's why it's not in this. That's why hearing. that's it. Yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions on public hearing? Um, is there anyone present who has questions on our public hearing information? Anyone online? No, uh, no one's online. No one's online. Okay. Are we obliged to keep it open for a minimum period of time? Not for public hearing, I don't think. No, right? not for public no. hearing. Okay, so uh, we will have to have a motion to close the public hearing. I will make that motion. Second. A second. All those in favor of closing public hearing? All right, thank you very much. Uh, passes.
Um, so we will open the regular meeting at uh, 6 15. All right. Right on time. That was pretty good. Okay, uh, so we'll open the meeting. Uh, we'll come to the uh, motions on the public hearing information after we do the public input. Um, and we'll do that along with the consent of information. So, public in input. Uh, anyone have we public have input? Chair. We don't have a chair. Oh, a table. Is there anybody present who would? I just have a question. Okay, and we'll. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the camera's going to have a nice picture of oh, yeah. Nice. Look at that teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, so my name is Brian Coogan, the Amherst president, and I saw on the agenda tonight um, one of the items around impact fees. And I was on the planning board. Uh, we'll look forward to collecting impact fees. And I just I, I, I unfortunately I can't stay in the whole meeting tonight, and just wanted to make sure like I can make it the time to come back and review the meeting. But, just what was the board looking to talk about impact fees this evening? Because there are a lot of like legal issues that go into leveraging impact fees and what they can and cannot be used for, and how much of the impact fees can be used for what purposes based upon the collection of those yes. impact fees. So I'm just really curious as to what the board was going to discuss this evening because there, there's a lot of uphill legal challenges that come with it. So, you know, we don't normally respond, but I can give you a brief one. Thank you. That is exactly why it's on the agenda. Okay. Right. <laughs> because yeah. we do have, originally we were looking at some in, using impact fees. We had a little concern that maybe we sh weren't have access to it, but we have some new information. So we have some general idea of how we might pursue to see whether we get a definitive yes or a definitive no. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, thank you. And I assume you are working in collaboration with the planning board. Well, and... Yeah, we've already talked to the slide. Then, of course. Yeah, we're already there. All right. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, we'll leave this here. Sure. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else that's present? No. Nope. And anyone online? No one's online. No one's online. Okay. So we will uh, keep public input open and come back to it at the end of the meeting. Um, so before the consent agenda, I'd like to go back to the motions for the from the public hearing. And there's two motions we need. Um, one of them is uh, a motion under RSA 198-20-B uh, to accept the total amount of funds for the district and expend the unanticipated federal and food service grants of $320,944. And I have a motion. I will make that motion. A motion to have a second. Second. Any other conversation? All right. Uh, those in favor of the motion, please. That's five, four, and none against. Um, and a second motion um, for the CNA projects, a motion to approve the $121,039 for the CNA projects to be expended from the Sohegan Cooperative School District Maintenance Expendable Trust Fund. So moved. Motion from John, second. I will second that. Second from Anna. Uh, any other discussion? Those in favor? That's five, four. That means none against. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, consent agenda. I, is I actually would like to make a motion yes. to move the community council update up to now <laughs> so we can <laughs> free some money. You know, I have the same thought it's going to do it after consent, but we can. In the future, if we can keep the community yeah. council update right at the beginning of the meeting, theater practice versus right. our last meeting where you were here to pretty late. Yeah, so get you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> any any objection to moving the so we can uh, yep. community council update? Well, stay for the full extent Thank of you. our <laughs> Unfortunately, I do have to. So it, yeah. please go ahead so we can get you to rehearsal. And yeah. <laughs> So Fangfest did go really smoothly. Um, right now, what SAC is working on is we're reaching out to Galen, our data and budget analysis. Sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, about the money that we have left over from that. Um, and then in council, we've been working on the forum procedure proposal, which was brought forward by Casey Fox, along with Dana and Jenny Dienick, um, with the objective of seeking to build capacity within our school for collaborative conversations and civil discourse as we create a participatory and inclusive environment where students and staff actively contribute to the decision-making process. 
The, uh, this proposal is really laying out a guideline for how the forums will be held. So they'll be held once a month which e with each grade to gather ideas, discuss issues, and express concerns and recommendations from their class regarding our community. Um, this really reinstates the roles that the grade reps have had at the forums. So for example, who would be moderating, who would be um, taking notes. Um, it lays out guidelines for speaking during the forums. So just making sure that there's one mic that's on the floor um, and anybody who wants to speak is going up to that mic. And then um, during council meetings, there will be preparation from the communicator to our grade reps, just making sure that people know what's happening and that they um, are able to really ensure that our community is feeling involved and um, informed. And then and the communicator will also give a video to advisories about the proposal prior to the forums to ensure that everybody in the community has their questions and concerns ready to go and ready to be asked. Yeah. Great. Any questions for Izzy? Do you want to give a quick plug for the musical for next week? Yes. Um, our musical, Sabine in Theater, is presenting at Beauty and the Beast. It will be um, from March 14th, 15th, and 16th. Um, it will be at 7 o'clock on all days, and then on the 16th, we have a 2 o'clock matinee. So it's just an earlier show. Fantastic. Yeah, four shows. All right. So, what is that? Is that yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 14th, 15th, 16th. Perfect. Great. Right. Yeah. Tickets are available online yeah. or at the school store. Or at the homestead or a home. Great. Awesome. Thank you so Excellent. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have fun. Thank you for pulling that up, student. For sure. All right. Consent agenda, draft minutes. Any questions on that? Seeing none, can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Make that motion. I have a second. 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 Uh, any questions? Any comments? All right, those in favor of accepting the consent agenda? That's all five. I guess. Thank you. Um, committee updates. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. I just want to. Oh, we have reports received before I jump through that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any, uh, let's just ask is there anything you would like to add before we go on with the principal's report? Sure. Yep. I have a couple updates um, in regards to enrollment. We, we, uh, we ha are having some uh, ongoing things with having to backdate. So with students uh, withdrawing to homeschool specifically, um, they, you know, we, we don't get fully notified. And so when I submitted the report, we had one and now we had more than one because it needed to be backdated. So I just wanted to update you there that we actually had um, one additional fresh uh, ninth grade student uh, transfer to homeschool and one transfer out um, to uh, another state. So uh, that that means the total enrollment is 863. So that I just wanted to update that. 685. Sorry, 683. 683. Okay. Yes. Yes. So so that has changed since I submitted the report. Okay. Um, and then the other piece is under the teaching and learning. Um, I left out the contact hours. Normally you get to see that on the side. So that's the amount of time that we're spending interfacing with teachers around their practice. So the informal is 101 contact hours and the formals is 153 contact hours. So I'm sorry I didn't include those initially. Um, the other piece is uh, you may have heard that uh, Isabel Brandt and Maddie Brown brought home a wrestling championship over break. Um, so we raised that flag for, uh, this week and we're very excited to have another banner. Um, so wanted to add that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions for Principal? So I have a question about the attendance issue, or not the attendance, the enrollment issue. So if I'm doing the math, we've lost eight kids in the last month Right, February 1st, March 1st, seven due to going to homeschool. So they're not there. Sometimes they get backdated. So they're not necessarily all from this month. Some, but the way that I had that the way that it gets reported out is like okay. that. And I would say, yes, we have uh, the majority of them to homeschool one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
do we have some, do they give any indication? I mean, it seems like a weird time. Yes. To in the middle of the school year. I mean, it's not an insignificant amount of people. All of a sudden be like, okay, never mind. Yeah. We're going to just homeschool here in the middle of the school year. Um, yeah. So we definitely have a lot of information about these. They're all pretty unique situations. It's okay. also a trend that we're seeing kind of throughout the state okay. um, because of some of the parameters around homeschooling. Um, so yes, we definitely, we, it's it's something that we're tracking for sure. Okay. And no particular theme among them that is like, okay, this is a problem. We're seeing a lot of people who are experiencing X complaint and therefore deciding to do this that need to be addressed or anything like that. Um, at this time, there's not a current there's not a current theme. Like I wouldn't, I, I don't feel comfortable saying, oh, it's this. I, I think sometimes mandatory attendance is sometimes a piece of it. Um, so sometimes when students are dipping their toes into the water of truancy and families feel like we've exhausted all the options, sometimes that's and, and from that's my experience happening. being a high school principal, uh it's after first semester that reality sets in. Mm -hmm. That maybe credits aren't being earned, you know, attendance is not being met, and then they're more likely to seek other options to okay. salvage okay. the school year. Uh, not knowing any of the specifics, but that, that the timing of the year is not a surprise to me. To okay. see a January, February, March decision okay. to do that. In some respects, it could be considered in some areas a work around the compulsory attendance. And I'm just glad we're part tracking and asking. We absolutely, right. yeah, because, absolutely. You know, so yeah. it's not. If there's right. anything we need to work on, yeah. I would rather work on that. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Well, if there's a follow up to that, but just, do we know whether these students who are transferring to homeschool are still availing themselves of what they're entitled to avail themselves here? Athletics clubs, organizations. You know, are they? We still have some kind of connection with them through other programmatics. Oh. So, do they do they know that they have it, or are they taking advantage of it? Well, I guess it's both. But I, I, I the, my question was, are they taking advantage of their um, rights to? Uh, the most stuff? recent withdrawals are not, um, but we do have. Uh, we did have a student. Uh, um at the end of January she's a homeschool student she's been a homeschool student but she did start to come in to take an elective here so yeah. we do have some students doing that um but recently yeah, they're not doing that. So it seems like if to the extent that some of them obviously speaking I don't know any of the individual circumstances but to the extent it's difficulty with the work or credits or the attendance requirements Those are potentially students who are less likely to to want to be coming in also to then add, take advantage of those additional things that they have, have available to them versus the I've been homeschooling for the whole year sort of situation that we're talking about. Okay. I, I do I think I, I do want to leave it to say um all I am personally familiar with all of these students' situations. So there's not, it's not someone who just says, oh, I'm going to homeschool and it came out of the boot for us and we haven't been trying a lot, a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. It's also, Dan and I have had in 10 minutes some conversations about how to do our best to meet the needs of a continuum of students with goals, aspirations, and connections mm -hmm. to our school. And we have specifically discussed, and Mike and I have been involved with some of these families um, with, with discussions. And so yeah. um, though they are at this time, the family has chosen homeschool for the best time. It doesn't mean, especially Dana, um, doesn't care any less for them. We still care deeply for them. But at this point, this is the decision made as a family. But we're continuing to strive right. to create an environment where every student in our community can be successful. And like I'd say that's one of the themes that in our discussions, you and I have been pretty regularly this year is to look at the continuum of students and how do we connect them to the school because not every student is looking at a four-year college experience and connected through that pathway. Mm -hmm. So it is, I'd say it's pretty often conversation, some of our conversations. Mm -hmm. well, we might see them again later on. We hope so. We hope so. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, other questions? Uh, I have one about the uh, SAT prep. How it's kind of in the middle of or tail end kind of now. Kind of the back, tail back end, yeah. Um, well attended. Uh, I mean, it's 
it's an amazing opportunity. Um, I said at the outset, but so good feedback, students engaged. Yeah, so far, so far. So we'll do a feedback. We'll do feedback with the kids once it's over. And um, but so far, the attrition rate this year is lower than in previous years. So generally, the trend that we've seen over the last two years is we get like a lot of kids are gung ho that they want to do it, and then as the course continues. And then they're like, I'm waking up early to come to this. We see that we see that drop off and we haven't seen that. So it's we had, you know, we had a morning session the Monday after vacation and everybody was there. Um, so that's been really great. Um, I think the teachers, we also have uh, the same group of teachers now having done it for three years. I think they found a really nice rhythm in terms of kind of mediating skills and doing some mini lessons and then doing has prep work. So um that's that's been really great as well. And any other questions? Um the athletic comment in terms of spectator um, conduct. Yeah. Can you address that a little bit deeper? Sure. Um so ongoing conversations with NHIAA at the at the meetings that we have with athletic directors. We're, we're, the bottom line is everywhere, not just in high school, but including high school sports. We're seeing an uptick in unsportsmanlike conduct from fans and spectators. And so um, and so there's been a lot of talk about how do we support athletic directors? How do we support administrators who are going to this event who are responsible for kind of managing the events and making sure that it that we're upholding all the about same values that we have during these events. Um, so some schools have added um, specific policies um, around behavior of spectators at sporting events. Um, I think at this at this point, I think our policy is really inclusive, and it's pretty clear that when we say these behaviors are expected at school, it means whether you're at Conway watching a seven meeting game or you're in our building, it's, it seems pretty clear. Um, we have had a couple instances um, where we've had to be a little bit more forceful with management, ask some people to leave um, as a last resort. Uh, but I think it's just important for, for the board to know that this is an ongoing topic of conversation. And as a student mm -hmm. services, parents, as family members? It's mostly adults. Okay. And do we have detail officers present that are addressing this issue? When necessary. When necessary. So a lot of them aren't. Some of them aren't that egregious. But when we know that, uh, when we know that there's been a history of situations, or we know that something's going to be really attended, or like uh, when we do the Battle of the Bridge stuff for hockey, um, we know that's going to be really big because we have four high schools coming together at one time. So we have a detail there. So we don't always have detail, but. We often do. Are there any uh, sort of events that are attracting other than now in this particular sport that we're having? No. Issues. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird. Yeah. This year, Kelly and I worked together on a family at the middle school that is no longer welcome to come to our school because of their actions of a resident of, of these communities uh, forfeited their opportunity the way they treated our opposing communities. Yeah. So it's struck. It's a real struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and you know, the piece is, uh, it, uh, the other piece of becoming hard is, uh, it's, it's not just for the environment and for the kids, it's also for the officials, it's really hard to get officials. And so we want to take care of the ones that we got. Um, so that's another piece. I have one more. It's about the, um. Uh... The data wise process going through the ninth grade mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a whole lot to say about it, but you're in kind of in the middle of it all. It's unfortunate the math didn't reach benchmark. It's great that the reading did mm -hmm. or exceeded benchmark. Mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciate the work is ongoing. Did you move on to the Ingwa? No, no. This is the data culture. Oh, case. culture. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I guess, are you? If you were planning on this, wonderful. I was look forward to it. If you weren't, then please do. <laughs> Some kind of maybe, I don't know, in the next, the medium range assessment, maybe that's what's next. Or when you have some data to share, a little presentation on, like, just here's what we did, here's the outcomes. Um, just to kind of 
I feel like I kind of know, but I don't really really have anything to like look at and study about kind of what you've been doing and, and the results that you've been you've been receiving. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think Matt McDonald, our you know student learning coordinator, has been deeply involved in this work, and I think it'd be wonderful for him to come and present once they've gone through the full process. Um, it it like clearly we want to be able to implement a strategy based on some data and have it work every time, but it, we know the reality is that that doesn't. So the fact that, you know, we did this and then we did the benchmark and it did the kids work where we wanted them to be, I, it's not a failure, right? It's just, it's, that's, that's the, the learning cycle. So I think once we get to the end of the year, I think that would make for a robust presentation. So something like before the end of the fiscal year, like at the summit of at the end of the school year. Yes. Maybe yep. Yep. Like that. Okay. That'd be really interested to see that and then the you the new results that you looked at those were the, for the ninth graders for those individual students mm -hmm. yeah and the psat historical data obviously that's not those students that's just it's tenth grade correct, right. correct that's just more like adding some data points into your correct right so when so Mike and Mike has been um, really good about talking about using different data for different purposes, right? So we have the NIWA data, which is targeting these specific students, and then we have the PSAT data, which helps us look at our instruction a little bit more. So kind of trying to triangulate the things that we're that we're doing. Okay. So, I just I would follow up on what you just said, Dana, on you know whether it's bad data or good quotes or good data, it's all still good to know. Because if, if there's a weakness somewhere, that's, I mean, only by really looking at where are there, where is there a weakness or where are numbers low, only by really looking at that as opposed to, you know, finding a way to hide that, um, can you actually improve it? So I appreciate it. Yeah, and me too. And I, I guess, is it, you know, the data properly. Yeah, I mean, way acknowledge it exists. Right. So with your point. Exactly. And acknowledge like, it okay, and then do what you can with it. Is it How we fix it? Proposed budget line? Is it just a refocus of attention? Is it professional development? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I guess um, is is are you sharing this process with um, middle school, you know, eighth grade, seventh grade as as so that there's they kind of know. If, if you're finding solutions to problems, are you sharing that across the district boundaries so that the, I don't know, call it best practices or those lessons learned or whatever, that growth is being shared um, across our system? So at this point, be. at this point, we're still just focusing if, on our on just trying to get through a year. Yeah, we're trying to get through. The, we're trying to. This is the first time that we, you know, we we spent time as a as a school learning about this approach to using data to improve instruction. And this year, we're implementing it to yes. see how it works. And of course, I think probably around the same time that we would make a presentation to the board, we we think there'd be great value in sharing it across sure. the district. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's also not one way to do it, right? Other they that we might have. They might be using, have a different way, different, you know, there's data wise, there's one protocol for doing this, and there might be other things happening that we could also benefit from hearing. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited to hear what happens. Perhaps yes. Thank you. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Dan, for that, for all your work and, and your administration running this school. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, treasurer's report or facilities report? Any questions on either of those? So the facilities report, is it possible to have Roger or Dana compute a list of incidences of vandalism so far this year? Got a report of um, multiple sort of courts pulled under sanctuary automatic uh, faucets. If we can just go ahead and see what that tally is this year, just so we can be informed on if this is interesting. interesting. We don't hear those. I mean, if it was prevalent, we would hear about it at the assistant superintendent or principal level or my level. So we'll look into it, but please know any report, any extensive vandalism is going to be reported to us and we'll report it out here. Yeah. But we'll track it for sure. Um, and I think overall, the vandalism has compared to when I was the principal here vastly improved. And I, I don't really have the reasoning for it. I imagine it's a combination of efforts of you know, custodians, SROs, administrators, teachers, mm -hmm. students maturing, rhythms, right? Systems put in place by Dana and her team, more supervision. Um, but we can absolutely do that and uh, 
and you know keep up on it. You know, yeah, so I mean, did the wall out back, I guess, had some spray paint on it uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. and then the same thing was new um, that, that that I heard. So you know, I just want to see if we can track a trend here and come up with some some approaches to address it. And more importantly, it's costing money. Yeah, right? absolutely. So how much is this yeah. costing at the end of the year? So thank you. Yeah, no, no doubt. And and you're gonna see upticks around Fang Fest mm -hmm. always, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh so we'll continue to, to work with that. We can get that. I give a quick shout out to students regarding that incident. Yeah. Sorry. I just so so that incident was related to Fang Fest. It was related to their their prank that they pull. And uh following that we had a really great grade level meeting and kids immediately went out and cleaned it off and uh and contributed to like the reparations and i'm just really proud of them for that so. yeah and one of those things that seemed like a good idea at the time they were doing it and then recognized that maybe it was well, i don't think they knew that spray paint went through a sheet but <laughs> right well but then realized that maybe this should have been handled differently yeah. I mean, the whole yeah. part of the school experience is to learn. Right? Yeah, right. So, you know, you, you know, come in and act, you do something, the time is seeming like cool, but then afterwards you're like, holy cow, that was really stupid. And there's consequences to that stupidity. And so, you know, this is a teaching lesson. And the reason why the report I'm asking for is because, you know, if we can follow a trend, what are the things and the steps that we need to put in place to go ahead and make sure that these things are being addressed on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We can add that to the principal report. We had that. We've cycled through that periodically when there have been upticks. So we can easily add that into the principal report. It sounds like what you were saying is the spray paint went through a sheet. It wasn't like an intentional spray paint. Yeah, no, it didn't it actually spray different. paint on the walls. No. Um, nutrition services five year report. Um, any questions on that? There's a significant change. From yes. five years ago, that's yes. actually incredible. And that's just the management that Crystal and Mark worked together on to yeah. improve yep. the expense. And I mean, some of those, you know, 21 and 20, those are those, heavily influenced by COVID. Right. Um, but looking back to 19, you know, that's, that's pretty high. Before that, um, the amounts were lower, but that was before we had the uh, food service director um, hopefully pushed out and benefits yeah. being allocated to the districts. So, yeah. so yeah, it's, um, and I just took a quick look at our latest projections and we're in like the lower 20s now. So she's working very hard to get us close to that amount um, that we budgeted for. So, <clears throat> Um, so a lot of good work going on there and really, you know, digging in on, on um, looking to any way to, to cut expenditures mm -hmm. and um, without sacrificing yep. pure quality. Yeah. Don't want to... She's looking at some creative ways yeah. of um, recycling menus so that you have more of a rhythm to menus and you can plan better. Mm -hmm. um, so she's, she's looking at that. The, the high school is heavily all cart, but even so, there's things that we can do to mm -hmm. to look at um, cutting expenses. So, mm -hmm. so this was a request by the board, so that's why it's a report. There. Any other questions on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the insights report. Uh, does anyone want to address any information in there first? Yeah. So I want to 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 let the board know. Um, one of the the primary reason, maybe the only reason this report was included in this school board was we got a right to know request for the NIWA reports for the, the last three years. And two out of the last three years, not the most current one, were reported to the and presented to the school boards. So initially we wanted to report uh, grant those as part of the request. However, when I looked at the right to know laws a little bit closer, it became clear that I, as superintendent, was required, even though this MIWA Insights Report was not shared with any boards, to give it to the, the requester. So out of respect for all school boards, we decided to include this Insights Report in reports received in every agenda across uh, the the SAU. 
Um, we're not prepared to go in depth, nor do I plan on going in depth about NIWA because for us, as we've been talking since August into the fall, it's about growth, it's about improvement. Uh, there will be a culminating a little more in-depth report at the 12th grade level when we get into all the data points from effectiveness to the growth to SATs to AP scores to attendance to college choice to NIWA. But for us, NIWA is not really something that we're going to get into. But with that said, because it's in here, Steve, I want Steve to turn it over to Steve because the assistant superintendents are kind of leading the work around this throughout the SAU. And then we'll field a couple of questions if you'd, if you'd like. No, um, very quickly, um, we had a meeting with NWA, and just to remind the board, NIWA is a multiple choice test, 40 to 45 questions in the lowest level of, of Bloom's taxonomy. This is this is assessing the lowest level of work, not work that we actually aspire to. So I, we just want to be very careful of making swift, huge generalizations from NIWA when it's 40, it's multiple choice questions that deal with the lowest level of learning. What Dan and I talk about it is it, not the aspiration about uh, you know general knowledge. It is all the way up to synthesis and beyond. It serves a purpose as we jig down this look at the fundamentals, but this really isn't. And we talked about this last year about how much comes to the board, multiple data points, and all that. This is really a, a, for Matt and the data team, the data team to look at. We, we're sending this to you because it actually, in, in in my experience, I thought a public document became public once it came to the board. But actually referred to our attorney this year was if, if that if board exists now, it has to be provided. Because I really felt specious about giving the community a document before boards get it. I always struggle with that. But we were recommended by legal counsel to do that. But it doesn't mean it's not useful for us, but I just want to don't make sweeping generalizations about something that's that's multiple choice questions and the lowest level of learning that Dana in her work is not aspiring to to do great right contact knowledge, it's much more beyond that. Um, but again, if you have questions, you can submit them to Stephanie, and I'll be happily prepared to dig deeper for you. But you will, and under Mike's leadership, uh, we're looking at, at like sixth grade at MV, fourth and eight at Amherst, and twelfth grade, a full uh, data analysis of our kids, including effectiveness, including all the data points that we have in some kind of right, retreat, possibly in July, when we have all this data together, we can spend some time unpacking. But this is to make sure, out of respect to the board, that if a community member asks, we can do that too. That make sense. <clears throat> um, so, are there any general questions we can? We can a, I have a general question. Um, to what extent is the NIWA results used to make decisions on budgeting, staffing, curriculum changes, and you know stuff where where it has a real impact on how we communicate? The decision making to the to the community. So it's you know how does maybe if we have all these data points? I don't you know. So how does this data sort of fit into that rubric of data that we use to make decision making that comes to us in terms of budget and allocations or or time allocations or whatever? It's it's a piece like uh, like Dan and I met and started looking at the next you know and and we are currently developing a self study for the math. The data here, score selection, the pathway, the state scores, all those data were saying that this is our next work uh, together and we've started that process. So this is one piece in that puzzle. Um, but it's so well, most of the work that we do in that area is self-funded. I mean, it's funded, it's funded within, we're not asking for another $100,000 to do the self-study. It's, it's work with Elizabeth and Anne, you, me, me a little bit, mostly you, you know, but. Um, so it's not really budget piece, but it does guide our next area of focus. Um, but to Mike's credit, we also have to persuade him that this is a leverage point because he is working very hard to narrow our, our narrow energies and focus on really what is high uh, you know, impact. And we do think we are right for math work. We've done math for K-5, we're doing math 6-8, and Anne, Elizabeth, Dan, and I are about to venture on the math 9-12. And all the data points come to say that's our next body of work. And I say that please perfectly into at, at the high school level where you, you look at the NIWA outcomes and you look at the students and, and, the, and the level of math they're in and, and who the instructor is and Matt and, and the Dean of Faculty and Domain Leaders will work together to say, hey, maybe this is an area because there is a trend between this, a local assessment and, and teacher observation that, hey, we might want to you know, kind of build around this and improve the skill or the acquisition of content knowledge in this area. 
that's really kind of how NEWA are used. One of the things that, you know, we kind of, when they talk about college and career readiness, I was always kind of baffled on why college and career readiness, readiness seemed low. And, and really what it is, is it, it's, it's not lining with the curriculum that we measure college and career readiness in regards to SAT preparation or US News World Rank Report. It's a different type of college and career readiness. So it's not the same. So you see college and career readiness in different data points and what's playing into that is not the same, you know, formula. And so you got to take this with, you know, kind of a, a grain of salt. And for us, you know, if, you know, I'm glad Steve said, hey, we're trying to narrow our energies. NIWA is a very difficult assessment to consume if you are not dealing with it on a regular basis. It's hard for educators to make a presentation so our friend Brian, who's in the audience listening, can understand what that means. Or even school board members who get 45 minutes to look at the presentation, they come here and ask questions. It's a it's a very kind of kind of uh, complicated assessment, in my opinion, to discuss publicly, but we would use it internally in complement with the other things that we do. And uh um so that's kind of where my head's at with that. And but really the, the real reason we wanted to share is because it is something we have used historically here. It was requested by a community member. And to Steve's point, we were really uncomfortable with people having stuff that you don't have. And, and that's really important to us. And, uh, and we're gonna continue moving on and, and uh, with it, but we'll, we'll take some questions on it because it has been used here in the past. And, and right now, the only grade taking it at high school is ninth grade. And, and I can go on record, if I had my druthers, we wouldn't use it at the ninth grade level. There would be another assessment that we would use and we'd work with the assistant superintendent and principal to, to use that because to me, it doesn't make sense when you just have one grade using it. And uh, and then really take that, that the way we're moving forward with 10th grade experience, I'm not sure it's gonna inform us the way we wanna be informed, but that's a conversation for another day. and. Uh, but there is a plan around data and data is very subjective and we will, you will, I am very hopeful and optimistic that when we do report out on the, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth, the 12th grade data, you'd be very pleased with the presentation and the organization of it. So it's easily consumable. So you have an active picture of what the experience looks like in the ninth through 12th experience at South Haven High School, uh, because pathways, look so vastly different. And the enrollment should be an indicator of that. To have people, eight students withdraw to homeschool in a year tells you the pathway in high school is very different in 2024 than it was in 2012 or 2002. And kids look at the different assessments and experiences in a very individual manner. And so I just want to make sure that we're really clear on that. Let me I'll add that we can move on. Because Tom's here, I want to make sure I have the same quote. Um, we don't fatten the cow by weighing it more often. We have to be very judicious on how much instructional time we lose to the number of assessments. At one point in our, when we started SAS, we used to have NECAP and we have NEWA and we have PSAT and we have all this. So it's one of the reasons why we're trying to synthesize this is because you can lose up to 19 days of instruction due to assessment. And that's a lot. And that's why I'm so pleased to have four additional days of instruction added to the PPC if all goes well on the 12th, because that really does compensate for the instructional time lost for the assessment. Uh, and so we have to make sure that what we use is really important to us because it's a loss of instructional time and, and, and just attrition in the assessment world. So, and Dana is absolutely, and Elizabeth, they're on it in, in, in the best way possible. And, and NIWA, NIWA in ninth grade is of value to us because we're giving it in the fall and we're we're getting data on the kids that informs our instruction for those kids at that time, right? It's not, and the growth that it's measuring has nothing to do with their instruction at South Eden because we're giving it to them in the in the fall of, 20, uh, of their ninth grade year. So that growth is from their eighth grade to ninth grade year. So what it's doing for us at South Eden is informing us of where kids are at so that we can modify to meet their needs. Right. It's when Mike start, Mike and Mike alluded to this, is when we start to talk about some other tests like PSAT 10, SAT, um, the PSAT when it counts as the national merit uh, in, in 11th grade. That's when we're looking at some of the achievement and, and other things in our building. That makes sense. 
So yeah, so thank you for clarifying. So I was going to ask Mike, like if you didn't want to use NEWA, why aren't we looking at what the alternatives is a better approach? But is it because it's the consistency of what they're doing in the fifth grade and eighth grade, those tests that when they come here, you're able to then reflect on? No, I, I or is it or is it something we should look at and switch? I think to a different no, I think it's a very fair question. And Dana sat in rooms with me over the years. I said, hey, if we had in my way, it would be ninth grade, eight, nine PSAT in ninth grade, 10th grade PSAT in 10th grade, PSAT in 11th and SAT in the in the spring of 11th, right? Three chances to prep and and uh, and then use that. And then we can use other, other assessments that we determine. So that's how we would do it. Um, and I think there's conversation around that. I'm not sure where we'll land. You know, uh, education moves slow sometimes, especially when you have some transitions happening, right? And um, but we've made some headway there. Okay. Next, I want to make sure we're doing the right thing yeah. Yeah. for the students, the right thing that gives you the data that you need in order to give you an idea of what your instruction needs are. So Thanks. that's important. All right. We'll move on for now. If you have specifics or Mr. Lover, like you have something yeah, before just, I move I, on. I mean, I, I'm all for evolving and heard not a lot of high value placed on this given your description of it. It's not an achievement test, it's sort of the lowest level of learning. Um, so, yeah, I took, kind of took the work right out of my complex. So, I'm asking myself what's the value of it, and especially if it's, you know, taking up instructional time that we are highly valuing now more than ever. Um, Maybe that should be on the table for further discussions. On the table. And as much as it, education moves slowly, our kids move through it relatively rapidly. So if we can make an impact on them, I say we do it as soon as we can do it with fidelity. Uh, no, I'm with you, John. And, and we don't move slowly, John. I say education in general moves slow. Like, you know me for the last four years. I don't move slow. Good. Right? <laughs> Dana doesn't move slow. Like, I was We're not giving the new one 10th grade. Right, right, and we don't have 10th yeah. grade teams, and so we've done a lot of work around that. Yeah, so it, it does seem a little useful to know where they are coming in, and in the absence of something else that does that. And what we heard earlier from you, Dana, was that it did help identify some areas of weakness yep. mm -hmm. that we need the teachers to focus on with the kids as they move up and get ready for the higher levels of the you know instruction. Yep. So it is it is a cornerstone of the data wise process that we're using right now. Right. So right. we're using it. All right. So it is TBD. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, committee updates. I'm not going to go through each committee, but is there anyone who has things they would like to add, things they're involved in? The only thing I want to add is that I know we've got some policies coming up and we've talked to some of them. I think there's some that we should try to. Uh, we moved to maybe waive the second reading and just pass to make sure they're consistent with the current um, statutes. <clears throat> but we can discuss we'll that when we get to there. Those. Right now, policy is finished Over. until we've got the new boards um, and the new members appointed, um, and then we'll be reconvening. I will say that it was a fairly successful year, and all of our minutes are approved. And posted somewhere. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the amount of work you guys do, it's impressive. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Any news? Yeah, so uh, the good old town of Auburn had our community gathering uh, now uh, just shy of three weeks ago. And um, we actually had a pretty decent turnout. We uh, normally uh, don't necessarily have that type of uh, feedback. And we had some people that don't normally come to these things come and share their thoughts. Um, some of them were questions around their health care, uh, and more importantly, our health insurance uh, increases, which I think is a pretty common theme amongst the community. Uh, I was able to successfully uh, at least articulate why uh, that's there. And um, I, I think they were pretty happy with, uh, with that response. Um, there was one uh, gentleman that did come and asked that I bring this up uh, before the board. Um, his grandchild had reported to him uh, that uh, they fear, feel, and fear uh, that there is a substance issue here, a substance use issue at the high school. Um, and what was reported back to him uh, really bothered him. 
and he was hoping that uh, we as a board could discuss um, what the school is doing about it, and more importantly, if there is an issue, uh, or if this is just a one-off type thing. Um, and I'm hoping that we can add that maybe to a future agenda item in April or May, uh, where we can talk about what the high school is doing from a substance use uh, education format, um, incidences over the past maybe one or two years um, that uh, have been reported, obviously student data actually excluded, uh, and more importantly, how we can maybe refocus some attention towards that particular category. I know last year we did a one-off on bullying, um, which was uh, successful, I guess, in a way. Uh, we're able to implement that through the advisory network, but substance uh, uh, use uh, is definitely something that uh, is, is a concern. Um, from a budgeting standpoint, uh, concern about our declining enrollment and, and um, our attention to faculty and staff, right? And so why are the two numbers not matching? So I think that's something that's gonna be a discussion for us this year. Uh, and then I gotta be honest with you, a lot of positive, positive things. Um, and one thing that we, we talk about uh, on an ongoing basis, I think in a community is what's wrong with things. We rarely talk about what's working. And uh, the things that are working here is that we're connecting with kids. And uh, Mike, I know you said that many times last year, that's kind of one of the, the primary missions of this place and how we connect with kids and make it a different high school experience. I think we're actually pretty successful in that. And based on the feedback that uh, a lot of folks actually provided to me that day, um, it's, it's built in the community. Uh, and last but not least, I would not uh, uh, be uh, doing my mom burn and uh, any justice if I didn't mention, they're very, very happy with the uh, emphasis that the high school is now playing uh, in the community and, and the fact that uh, this school, this institution is now actually pushing up ahead uh, and people feel more and more involved. Um, they said there's definitely more things to do, um, but uh, they're extraordinarily appreciative of that. Um, and then the last, I apologize, the last thing is um, if we can possibly get uh, an update, whether from the board, so Anna, your comments um, that you're going to generate, or um, maybe something from Dana in our town newsletter that's actually issued out at the beginning of the month. The deadline for that is the second or third week of the previous month. And so if we get something in there, it will go out, be pushed out to roughly around a thousand monthly participants. Can so, you shoot me like you have contacts on who that would be? I do. It's one of our community council persons. Could you shoot me that like an email or something? Absolutely. And I always have the 20th on my calendar as like a deadline. Yeah, so we, I think the deadline's kind of moving, to be honest okay. with you. And I'm, I'm sure someone will call me out for saying that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, I think it's a moving deadline, but um, it does go out pretty religiously around the first, okay. second week. You give me the earliest, like the 20th, because what I could do is I could do a, like this weekend, just a final, like, you know, go, you know, voting's coming up. Here's the links again. Here you can find the yeah, information that's, yeah, that's, that's coming out after well, I know voting. Then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, letters I'm not going to do that, yeah. but I could, I could do that, and then, uh, you know, a general kind of update on the other, <laughs> the other issues, and then if everybody's good with it or it looks fine, you know, obviously not the first part, but the second part, um, just translate. The best way to describe it is we literally get a paragraph. That's it. So there's nothing more detailed. There's nothing elaborate. We don't get pages of data that we can put in there because the flyer's two pages. Let me just be honest. So it just needs to be so, okay. So it's just short, 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 Awesome. And I went to a, a meeting that uh, Amherst community member had put together to talk about the different deliberative sessions. Um, they spent 99% of the time discussing Amherst school board issues and things. So there wasn't a whole lot for me to say or do, um, but I did attend to try and get it clear. So <laughs> that's how it went. Uh, anything else? I'll move on from there. Um, so personnel. So Mr. Barry, do would you like to address the dean of faculty, the critical shortage area, retirement? Yeah. So I think what we'd like to do is we'd like to do the the first four topics in public, and then do the twenty four twenty five teacher nominations in non public at the at the end. And then if you come back out and improve them, you know, for those. But I think the other 
the other four things we can do in public right now that works for everybody. And the, and the first thing that is up is uh, we like to um, have the school board uh, uh, approve the nomination of uh, Elizabeth Charbonneau as the next Dean of Faculty. Um, what this does is essentially remove the interim tag from, from her title. And uh, then from that, we will then go ahead and, and begin the process of looking for uh, Manny's domain leader. Uh, so this is kind of like this, this approval does two things. It, uh, it's in Trello, the, uh, the recommendation from, from uh, Principal Curran to nominate Elizabeth Charbonneau. And, and I would like the board to approve that nomination. Mm -hmm. Move to approve the nomination of Elizabeth Charbonneau to be our Dean of Act. I have a second. A second. Any other discussion? And then I have to say, I'm very excited. I think she's done a phenomenal job over the past few years. I appreciate her hard work. And Dana, I know you work closely with her, and your, you know, the team that you are surrounding yourself with. It really is deserves his great leadership. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So those in favor of the motion. That is five. With no notice. <laughs> uh, thank you. Critical shortage area. Yeah. So also, this is what located in uh, board notes. Um, what we're hoping is that the Sauvignon School Board can declare a local critical shortage for a business teacher. Um, this is uh, necessary for us to employ uh, an employee who's completing a site-based learning plan to obtain their credential. Uh, teachers in good standing. Um, and the course assignments are full, and, and this is a, is a necessary thing. And uh, so we're hoping that the school board can declare a local critical shortage. Uh, Steve, you want to add anything to this? You did great. You nailed it. Um, this is what we've. Um, so business is not on the. Uh, the they've, they've done a lot of revisions to the state critical shortage list. Years ago, all the disciplines were, and they've removed some. I don't know exactly why. They used to, in the old days they did a a, a survey of superintendents on. The hiring a number of applicants, but I don't know if that exists anymore. But for our sake tonight, we need to declare a, a, a local critical shortage area. We've done it in other districts, um, and that enables us to qualify the, the, the teacher for a site based learning plan, uh, which when then we support getting their credential. So it's a it's a, a, a regulatory requirement. I appreciate what we're doing. So is, is this new teacher or the current teacher yeah. who we've passed this for before? Correct. This is the, so. The currently the, this this teacher this is the next stage for the current teacher. Okay. Sorry. So I, this is to continue. This is the same one that we yes. Just, so yeah, this thing on. It was an emergency authorization this year. Now we go to a site based learning plan next year. Okay. Got it. Is there um any it's very um sounds like a defined certain term local yes it is here. like that so do we have all of the information necessary to make that determination like the teacher is in good standing is that checking a box that that have to be a minimum requirement um no or, I mean, or the no. person is in a uh, site-based learning plan like is there a minimum criteria that we need to be aware of to validate that our declaration of a local critical shortage is legitimate according to um Whatever regulation. You're welcome to take the, the superintendent's word for it. Uh, I, but I, I will, but I just, you know, we it, the, well, I would hate for this to come really, back in three months where, oh, we just didn't do it the right way because it wasn't in a public hearing and we have to do it over again. Okay, so to the extent that there's about if you try to find another right. So if you remember last year we couldn't we couldn't hire anyone with a grant. We we hired some in emergency authorization. Um, it, I, it is, don't expect we understand that that has not changed. There is still that shortage within the field. Correct, based on yes. our regional look, but also um, we have a wonderful teacher, mm -hmm. and um, who it fits in a lot of categories. Who is incredibly invested, and it's my honor and privilege to support her in her ability to get a credential, yeah. and it's what's best for kids. And um, we know her seen her and uh, she is about as excited and passionate new teacher who has found her calling to quote unquote and uh, so um, it was the first year we weren't sure but it's 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 exceeded all our possible expectations and it's my privilege under, under mike's leadership to support her in that credential and the first step of that is to declare a critical shortage okay so i think that's i think 
the second part of that is great. The, you know, that she's fitting well and doing great. I think that's wonderful. We're probably supposed to declare the critical shortage independent of that, right? I mean, if there were 50 well-qualified people who were credentialed, even if we thought not this person will be a better, we, 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 we yeah. have to say no. The fact right. is we, but we, what we know, we just for the record and yes. why we're voting on this, what yes. we know is that having done a search very recently, you got it, you're doing it is a very, very critical shortage. And it's very unlikely we'd find someone equally as qualified, even, you know, you. Un under the circumstances. That was very that well said. said. That's very All well right. said. I'll make I a motion to declare the critical shortage. I second. All right. One piece of further discussion. Just that's exactly what I was getting right. at. Well, yeah. it's there's no data in your bullet point. We looked for this long for this requisition from this time period and came up with nothing. We did this step. We did this step. We did this step. Therefore, it's reasonable for us to declare a local critical shortage, which sounds like a major decision. To be honest with you. <laughs> As opposed to a sort of perfunctory decision that's just along a normal pathway, and they just have to work the same thing. But we know what we did very recently, and we know that the market is not. Um, I mean, what we've seen in the other areas, it's not like we're having a resurgence of uh, teacher um, availability, especially and certification. In business, it's a very it's a challenge to hire business. Well, yeah. and, it, and it should matter that we have now experience with the person that we really like, and they're doing a great job. I mean, boy. Or you roll dice when you hire right. But no, but that way, that, right. that, that, that was just, just on the contract. Just for the record, the two separate. Yeah, yeah that'd be a two separate minutes. contract issue versus. Okay. Right. I yeah. yeah, I am. I am very glad to hear that it, it's worked so well. Thank you, Tom. Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, can we have the uh, the motion to uh, approve a critical shortage area? I'm right, but yeah, can we have so and no any other discussion? Well, not okay. Let's vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's fine. Appreciate that. Sorry about the and those minutes. What happens now is when we do all this, we send the minutes to the state. Uh, and next under personnel, we have an FY24 retirement request. Uh, this request is out of regular order. Uh, it's for compelling reasons. The letter is attached to Trello. So if you had the opportunity to read uh, Mr. Jolene Sawyer's request to retire early, I hope you did. Um, you know, if you have any questions, we can have further conversation in, in non-public. But I'm, what I'm asking for tonight in, in public is to approve the early retirement request of Jolene Sawyer um, with the deep regrets. So I do have a question on her. Yes. And and I will start my question by saying I want to do this for her. Okay. I think I think if there's a way to make this work, we should do this for her. It's um, you know, I, I completely understand why this is an incredibly difficult situation for her to continue. And and it's just the whole thing is just tragic. Um help me understand exactly what what this means as far as what we're doing. Like, are we giving her the equivalent of the benefit that she would have gotten if she'd given this this notice last year? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then I'm fully yeah. and, so basically and we're we, just waiving the requirement that this because she right. obviously had no idea right. that her and, husband was going to pass away. Correct. And we and, and the, the fellow the teacher and all that funding stuff. of all of this is uh we'll be having a public hearing next meeting in order yeah. to be able to withdraw money from that trust fund. Yeah, in order to yeah. make sure that we can prove this. But basically, we're yeah. just putting her in the same situation as if she had told us last year, if yeah, she had right. been able to foresee right. what was yeah. going to happen in her life, which obviously she couldn't, right. that she's doing that. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's giving her. Yeah, exactly. Right. Figured fully, out. I am fully yeah. in favor of that. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood what, what it was that yes. we were doing. Yeah, I was going to explain. Yes. yes. Yeah. So we have. Exactly. And the, so subject to the public hearing and the approval of that funding from that trust fund, um, I, do we need a motion on that? I would motion that we accept and we, we have to do a public hearing on that trust fund, so that'll be a next meeting thing, but, but we can't. I, mean, I just want to approve it. We have to accept the retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we, it will well, be. We're not accepting the I mean, she says specifically that if we're not going to do this, then she won't retire. So yeah. we're, we can't accept the retirement. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I would 
motion. I think I can motion this. Yeah, you can. That's subject to the public hearing and approval at that time. Yep. That we would, you know, we we accept her request and we move ahead with that process. Yep. That's a yep. great motion. That's fine. Yep. Thank you. Did you get that, Dan, today? All right. Second. second. Oh. <laughs> Mr. O'Keefe may have the second. No. Okay. <laughs> um, is there any other discussion? Okay. Um, just want to, you know, say that uh, I think we all understand and we care. And uh, we wish her the best. Thank you. Thank you. And if she changes her mind, she's welcome. Always. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we need to vote on the motion. So those in favor of the motion, that's five. None opposed. And then the there are three other retirement requests that we would need to vote on. And those are just all regular course, and we usually don't right. Correct. announce Correct. the names, right? Because we That's let those presented. individuals and do that when they're presented. ready, right? Yeah. So, so I'll make a motion that we accept the three regular course retirements for FY25. Second. And we well, have... I mean, there's no accepting of it. They're entitled to this, yeah. There's no accepting or not accepting. We, we, we go through the process of accepting for time. Yes. Yeah. We have I would never yeah. stop somebody retiring to retire. Right. 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 Yeah. No. It's like you need to separate It's just right. It's just acknowledging, I guess, that we've gotten it and then they are starting that process. Right. That's kind of how it's right. All right. So motion was made. So these just to be clear for So the regular ones mean the rest of this year plus one more year and then boom. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 Just the regular notices <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Okay. It's a combination of teachers and staff. All right, so we'll vote on the motion, right? Okay, those in favor of the motion. That's five, we're not opposed. All right, and the teacher nominations, we will discuss in non-public, and then we'll come out and vote on that. Is there a public discussion? So the only on? thing um, that we want to make sure that, that uh, because we are going to approve nominations prior to the budget approval, any position that is not in the default will only be approved pending passing the budget. Right. You with me? Because we don't have a budget yet. We're, we're, we're approving the, the slate. Conditionally approving, basically. Exactly. Yeah. For only the position, there's only one position, and that's the business teacher mm -hmm. that is not in the default. You with me? Right. You're picking up what I'm putting down? Yep. Got it. So, um, and that's a public, that's, the, that that's is, good for the public to know that. Correct. That we are not obligating funds that have not been approved by the public body, right? Which is too simple. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. 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 That was good. No. Thank you. I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah. All right. So we will revisit any that other new hires are just replacing people who positions correct. that exist, so they're already accounted for in our default budget. Correct. Yes. There's only one. There's other positions, but only nominating tonight. Correct. Right. We're doing great. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Sir. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, the impact fees. So last meeting, I had said that you know, upon reflection of the letter we had received from through the selectmen, well, it was actually from their lawyer through the selectmen yeah. about you know asking whether we could answer some questions on the impact fees, and I was uncomfortable saying we could do that. Uh, Amy did a little more digging, uh, and I believe along with Steve and came up with some more information. And Amy, do you want to walk us through that? Because there's a chance that maybe we might pursue another ask and some discussion before we really, and we're trying to see if there's going to be definitive no or yes. But Amy, I think- Just put a quick to context just to yes, hear yeah. everybody back. Yep. So just to bring everybody back where we were, um, after the seventh and eighth grade discussion and the closure there, the board motion and action is to pursue impact fees for the redesign of a life science lab at the annex, if you remember, because during the accreditation process and during the tours, like when Amy and I, remember we had the um, laser beam yeah. thing and we went to all the science labs yeah. and they were way under. Instead, instead, we, we, and one of the things that we have two choices, either cap the class at six, remember we, we can cap the class at like 15, 16 based on the square footage, and that oh. came from the review committee that came back to say, what, right. why haven't you done anything right. yet? So the so that was the, the, the benefit of 
moving on from the preschool discussion, moving on from the seven and eight, that we then put our energies into. And, and Dane and I, I forget the name of the NEASC meeting, but it was a funky meeting. Like it was a, with a little stakes there. It was an, yeah, an update on a substantial change. But it was like a, yeah. an accreditation review that I'd never been a part of and yeah. we toured. And we reported that we are pursuing impact fees to a redesign to create a life science lab that meets the standards. I met with Erica, I met with Julianne, Mm -hmm. And so that's the context to this uh, of working through that, which is exciting. And it's one of the things that Stephanie and when I got here in my first year, it was big money in the budget for science. There was, we were right. trying. <laughs> so that's the context and impact fees are being pursued to pay for the 90,000 possible uh, design of the lab. I just want to bring it, because it was a while ago. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that's fine. So I don't know if um, you had a chance to go through Trello, but if you haven't, maybe go in there. There's um, the uh, the response letter from the Board of Selectmen's attorney going through the questions that um, they're asking of us to answer in order to determine whether uh, the, the district is eligible for the fees. Um, there was a Confusing, there's some confusion around the, the funding piece that I addressed in an email. So that email is also in there. So I think we've got that cleared up. Um, I also did a brief PowerPoint presentation for you all to just take a look at to give you um, just sort of a primer on impact fees. Um, and I think I also put the policy and the, um, uh, the recommendations or information from the consultant that the Board of Selectmen hired to help them um, provide guidance on what, what is eligible uh, for impact fees. So there's a lot of information in there, uh, more than we probably wanted to go through tonight, but it's in there for you to take a look at. Sorry. Yeah. On the Trello, I'm looking It's in at, Trello. It's only seen the three PDFs of an email. I don't see a PowerPoint. Yeah. Right. I don't see. Oh, it's probably in just PDF. Oh, it's just add. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. No, there's, four, there's four items. There. Yeah, it's yeah. a short PDF. Okay. It's yeah. just a, a primer. No but so the main question that caused us pause mm -hmm. was um, we're being asked to tie new development in town to this specific project. Mm -hmm. So the other um, questions that were asked, we, we think are pretty easily addressed. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not replacing something, we're um, enhancing um, a facility. There's definitely more than a useful life of, I think it's five years, so so those are fine. Um, but in reading um, the documents provided by the Board of Selectmen and the consultant, we think that we're possibly, um, the school impact fee is, does may not necessarily need to be tied to new development because it's a recruitment of prior capital investments um, that has created the capacity. So we're not sure, but so so what we want to do as a next step is have a meeting with the board of selectmen, the attorney, um, folks at SAU, and probably Stephanie to um, to ask that question. And if needed, we may need to get legal counsel to help us, but. First step, we just want to have a meeting to talk it through. So one of the you can you know, one of the terms um, which I think applies directly is to enhance capacity. And so if the recruitment allows us to have a project that enhances capacity, then we may in fact qualify and utilize them. We haven't had a definitive no. We've had some questions raised, and as our fiduciary, we'd just like to continue the process and meet. Um, the attorney, Steve, Steve Whitley, is uh, he's a selectman in Hopkinton. Um, I've worked with him in the past. And, um, I think it would be a, a, a worth our while some time to meet with him, Dean, Stephanie, Amy, Mike, just, just to get together and pursue the use of the fees until there is a, a declaration of a definitive no. It's just our fiduciary to, to steward funds here because we really would like to get moving on the Life science. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's potentially $90,000 that can be used by the SEBI and Cooperative School District. So I think it's well worth um, our time to, to try to exhaust everything mm -hmm. and try to um, access those funds. But and it's something we need to do. We you know yeah. that you know, right. some of the grades lower down that are moving our way or are bigger. Uh, uh -huh. We know we don't have the room for what we've got 
for yeah. now to adequately do what we need to do in the life science class. Yeah, exactly. And the rooms aren't designed correctly for this work that's being done. We really I'm need to look at the issue, though, of, yeah. of upcoming growth and, uh, you know, the need to accommodate the upcoming growth for the purpose of this specific discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Look forward to it. I always like to learn. We'll learn about impact fees. I did a little bit of work in my past life on impact fees, but uh, looking forward to it. Yes, With yeah. board support, we will vigorously pursue every fund yeah. possible for this wonderful yeah. meeting. You know, it's a lot of interesting words you could hang on. Because it's not just yeah. about capacity. Right. In the same instance, it's an increase to the level of service. Yeah. So we don't have a level, any real meaningful level of service for a life science lab. And it's a modern day thing. So I could very easily argue that Building a proper modern life science lab is an increase in the level of service. I'm with you. Yeah, because, yeah, because we don't you. have the room designed to address the curriculum that should be presented, the right. way it should be yeah. presented. So it's really just the first issue to bring it forward as a tying new development. Yeah. And that, to me, that was the, really the stumbling block. But if, if that requirement does not need to be met, then all of the other questions, I think, are easily answered. Yes, the other ones are easy. But we should not necessarily give that up, though, because I right. do think, again, the new development is yeah. part of what's leading to bigger classes yeah. getting our way. Yep. Yeah. And the need to be able to accommodate those students With it. Yeah, is is part of yeah, this piece. And the more boxes that are checked, yeah, the better. Yeah, we won't, we won't give any of them. <laughs> well, and then, you know, and it gives them the ability to justify it as well, because yeah. that's what they need to be able to do. And, you know, I mean, it goes back to the developers. So we need to be cognizant of that. Exactly. Because if there's a, you know, legal challenge from a developer, right? the more we've shown that we meet, you know, three different criteria or multiple criteria, right. the less room for challenge there. Right. And these are collected for the school. Like, you'll see right. that there's, so they're the collected stuff. specifically yeah. for different groups yeah. in town, and these are for the schools. This is the amount that's set aside mm -hmm. sitting in a, in a bank account, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will, I'll, I'll move forward to the meeting with them and we'll yeah. make sure we update you Go for this yeah. next meeting and we'll be timing. Thank you very much. Good. Thank Appreciate you. it, thank you. That's a big one. Um, the reading of policies, would uh, John or Anna, would you like to address the policies that are in the, at all? Is there anything, or is it just? I mean, the only ones. I mean, they're the ones we went through at the yes. SAU meeting that I think everyone here was at. So I don't know that we have to go through them, unless uh, there's a specific thing. Most of them are fairly straightforward. The one I think we need to actually act on is, I believe it's JCA, just because the statute has changed regarding. Um, what is allowed and what falls into it. And I think it's important that we have our policy consistent with that statute should this issue come back up at any time in the near future. Okay. Yes. Because I don't think we should be changing that mid process. And I think we have to have a process. We really should have a process that's consistent with the statute. Agree with that? Yes. And which, which one was that one? J J C A. J C A. Okay. And that's the change of class. The rest, some of them are, I mean, we've talked about them. I mean, a lot of it, um, but we've got the first set. And then there's the um, last one, IJOC. The only thing to note on this one, I think, is that it's actually a tiny bit different. Each of the districts has its own kind of policy on here, <laughs> so like, you know, policy language, because the requirements for volunteers, obviously, for little children is a little different than what we're looking at. Um, so just yeah. I think worth noting that IJOC is not necessarily exactly the same. Well, it is not the same as Saudi you know, it's, Amazon. It's our policy with the designated volunteer language having been added because what we wanted and what we talked about at the meeting was the, the, the designated volunteer language was in a couple of different places. And, uh, you know, we wanted, if a volunteer came to the volunteer one, to be able to figure out who that was and what that applied to. So that was absolutely. But I think other than that, the same ones that we reviewed at the SAU 39 meeting. And I don't know if there's questions, we will try to answer them. Okay. But only add to that, yes, 
And it, the only thing that changed in our IJOC volunteers policy was the new definition of designated volunteer. As far as I understand, that def definition is now harmonized across the three districts. The rest of the body of the policies, however, are different. Right. Mm -hmm. Amherst has a much more extensive uh, volunteer policy than we do. And Anna and I did not feel compelled to come up with our policy. It hasn't been an issue, but um, having a harmonized definition of designated volunteer seems worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. It was helpful for the SAU as a whole. So it's going to be folks that need to be, you know, uh, background check. Yeah. And it gets, you know, really complicated if you've got a different designation for that all across the three districts. Yeah. Okay, so I would move if there's no questions. I, I've move. got a couple of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yes, um, first of all, I really want to thank you for defining the uh, designated volunteer. I think it's the language is very concise and very consistent with, uh, I think, with the expectation of, you know, uh, I don't want to call them permanent volunteers, but a frequent volunteer, I think, is probably what uh, is there. Um, what I didn't find in the trouble covers is the discussion specifically around. Um, the background checks about designated volunteers. Did you guys talk about the frequency of that background check? Um, is that something because the policy on employee standards in terms of you don't report, there's a requirement to report as an employee if you have involvement uh, with law enforcement, you get arrested. A volunteer doesn't have anything to quote unquote give up in terms of their career. And so there'd be a little bit more, I guess you can say in the line of, oh, I forgot. And, and there's no consequences. So did you guys have a discussion about frequency of background checks every two years, every three years? Or is that something that we don't want to include in the policy? Let me look at GBCD. So, I don't so remember. I'll just while you're looking at that. The reason why GBCD, GBCD is in here is because it is where the definition of designated volunteer resided. But that policy is about background investigations and criminal history records checks for all sorts of reasons. Designated volunteer is only one of them. So, I mean, that would be the place to look for timelines and when things are due. Yeah, there is no timeline for, for our designated volunteers. And I think it's something that should be probably carved out specifically. You yeah. know, as an employee, if an employee has an issue, they're required to report it, their job's up. Uh, a designated volunteer doesn't have that same sort of stress or, or requirement. Yeah. Because I know, like, so the falsification or mission is such. Um, Good point, because I know like even as a Girl Scout volunteer, it gets renewed every five years at most. So GBCD. Um, is basically. Uh, is still the applicable. You know, it's still applicable. It's just that the language the the. Hold on, let me switch back to the. Yeah. Yeah. The way you guys have bundled it in there, it actually refers yeah. to the employee sort of same components because we've thrown the designated yeah. volunteer into that. Yeah. That, that so policy. GBCD basically takes out the definition, but all of it still applies. Um, but it doesn't say there's a timeline for everything. Yeah. It doesn't. Have, yeah. It does so have by the way some back anybody. No, no I, I, I don't think it would be important for an employee to have uh, every two years sort of thing, because I think um, if we follow our other policy, and I forgot the numbers, I did this all in the train. Um, Steve, maybe you can help me. The policy that requires employees to report criminal. It's the code of conduct, code of ethics. Yep. Um, but there's another one that means there's grounds for termination for failure to report. Yeah. Yeah. Misdemeanor, well, not misdemeanors, no. Penalties, correct. Not misdemeanors. Correct. As a volunteer, we wouldn't necessarily hold them by that same standard because they're a volunteer. And so I think the discussion of maybe putting in a, uh, a more frequent sort of review, whether it be five years or three years or two years, I mean, that piece is up for debate. But I think from a volunteer standpoint, if someone's constantly in the schools, which is awesome, by the way, um, but I think we owe it from a protection standpoint to at least have some sort of review over that. That's a really good So one. currently it's a, a break in service. Yeah. If like, like we have a sub, Back on check, they come from south and they don't sell for us a year. They're coming. We back on check again. If there's a year break in service, and, we, and um, I was actually part of some legislation a couple of years ago. I was trying to get a background check every time you renew your credential as a teacher, even though those are mandatory reporting yeah. every three years mm -hmm. um, as part of the credential. But it's a huge system. 
and I don't think they had the capacity to imagine one a third of every New Hampshire public school teachers every year. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a lot of legislation about that. But I, it's very interesting. And we, I think it's definitely germane for discussion. So, Two, three, four, but that, because you're right. Yeah. Volunteers are not subject to the same requirement as employees with a mandatory report. So you're, I think you get a thing. So, yeah. um, so is there a way, and I, I know you guys probably aren't meeting until... After we can back it. Right? Are you okay to look at that? I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, is it does refer back to the RSA, and I, which is unfortunately too long for me to figure out really quickly on a fly here what exactly it says about how often this happens. What, what I would like to do is um, I, I, I want to clearly define it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys have done a great job. I love the definition of designated volunteer. I really am 100% in sync with that. Maybe we approve it tonight to have something on file immediately so we can then, for new volunteers coming into the district, require the background check, yep. go through the process, <laughs> and so forth. but put this on the agenda for your policy committee First in block, May yeah. or wherever you guys organize to then have a discussion about do we want to add a time frame for volunteers because they don't fall under the same criteria as right. Right. And, and I'll that. just have to look, I'll, I'd be happy to do that. And what I, and, and I'll, and I can go back and look at the RSA and see if there is a yeah. built in time that's being addressed by reference here. Yeah. I don't think there is. But I don't know. There is. I mean, I'm the seeing some. Volunteer. It's, it just um, says you have to have one. Okay. I think yeah. I mean, yeah. They don't, if we're up to, we're left to define it. Statute doesn't define it. So. <clears throat> so happy to yeah so okay to approve it but let's put a, a note right yep. in that trello or wherever they can be communicated yeah. first thing when it right to add to that's a small change that shouldn't take yeah, it's it's the only issue i mean there's going to be a cost associated with the change and that's by the record keeping at the sau to sort of keep track of volunteers but we should already be doing that anyway once we get it's the superintendent required to do the background mm -hmm. check he's the one that actually sees it and treads it within the time frame like there should be some sort of process that hey steve o'keefe is a volunteer he's up for yep. a renewal of his background check send a letter hey you have to do it so we'd have to do that probably through the hr department mm -hmm. correct yeah it's a like a reminder yep it's almost like a continual maintenance of yep. pmi because we, we do have volunteers that are here for our yeah, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. We want to recognize that it's right. coming else to the We do tie it to the um uh to, to every school employee whose position requires criminal background check under this section. I don't know, maybe that doesn't cover it. Uh, as just teacher no, no, I'm just reading the section because there's one thing that requires like certain training every two years. We tie it with that, but um yeah, we can absolutely take a look at that. It's a great idea. Yeah, thank you. Are there comments on any of the other policies that are listed? EBB, EBBD, GPC, IJL, JCA? There uh, is in the library as well. So the library yeah. one completely rewritten from a subject standpoint. Um, so, yeah. well, okay. no, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, sure, sure. So inside that policy, it references IGE. Uh, and the carve out in your language, whether it was online or uh, was was purposeful to remove IGE um, and let that stand as a standalone, and we removed parent uh, appeal of specific course material, and we took it out of our library policy. Yeah. So I didn't see the discussion as to why there, because right now what we've done is we've removed parents' ability to. Um, to, to question the course material, we only gave them the option to pull their kid out of that particular course of curriculum. So the discussion on that, and I'll let John jump in, is that also, because um, was that for IGE, well, basically that, that, that <laughs> one was, although it was referring broadly in definition to course material, I mean, to everything, it really was IJ, sorry, IJL really was about resources in the library. Mm -hmm. Like it's not the the library specialist who's deciding what materials we're going to use for course materials. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 not you're not using the same same criteria. You're not using the library 
I don't remember what it's called, the all the, all the language that we had at the end, the like code of whatever it was. Oh, you mean like the Bill of Rights? The Bill of Rights, like the Library Bill of Rights, the freedom to read doesn't necessarily apply to the materials being used in a social studies class. Mm -hmm. And there is this ability already built in, I mean, to the social studies class or the history class or the English class for a parent to say, I don't feel like this material is appropriate for my child, so I don't want my child to participate in this part of that instructional. Mm -hmm. You know, we're gonna we're gonna give them something else, or but there's this there's already an entire policy to address that. And since so much of the process for the library resources didn't actually even wasn't actually even consistent with that. Because again, we don't have the same people even making the decisions. Um, you know, there's there's all this language in IJL about the you know the the, the librarian making the decision to to get the books, what the books they're going to have, how they're going to staff the library, um, which is completely separate from how the um, academic piece is is selected and used. Yeah, so I I hear what you're saying in terms of the the purpose of removing it now, but we're also removing a right away from parents to question some material because it was in, available in the prior policy. So if we take a look at paragraph one objective for IJL and KEC under the old policy, the existing policy right now, um, you know, the first one is learning resources, including library and instruction materials are selected by the school district to implement, enrich, and support educational program. Uh, but they're afforded them an opportunity to go ahead and, and question that through an appeal, a, um, you know, hey, bringing it forth to, I don't, I'm assuming the teacher would be the primary person, because uh, it's not that clear. Um, are we now no longer affording that same right to a parent? No. No, the parent no. still has all the rights under IGE to come forward. It's just that they're coming forward with regard to their kid. Just a different policy. Of yeah, and, and I, I see your point. The only... And remedy to them, though, is the exclusion of their child from the classroom, whereas the library allows a more proper hearing process of why was this particular position selected, go through the process of, you know, all, all the stuff that's actually laid out in the policy. That's no longer afforded to them when they're questioning something on the curriculum. So I think, I think there, I mean, there could be, and I'd be happy to discuss with policy whether or not IGE should be revised to expand that. I do think it still makes sense to have them separate just because the whole process oh, was selected. I, don't agree. Separate. I just don't want to but, ignore the other stuff. Right. Like, like, okay. should IGE be separated, be looked at? And do a and, copy and paste of the process and procedure under IGE to afford a parent to actually question the curriculum. The one difference is that the library has materials that anyone uh, from the school can walk in and look at. Yeah. Right. So I am. You know, my, my, you know, short of me doing the, I won't let my kid check this book out, but, you know, there isn't a way to prevent a student from walking in and browsing through the library stacks and finding or going through whatever might be of interest to them. Okay. Um, which I think, I think when you look at the educational materials for an individual class is a little different because one, you could have a parent who says, as they're helping their, their student pick what their courses are going to be next year, I don't think that's enough appropriate thing I want you studying you know we're not gonna let you sign up for this course mm -hmm. you know I mean it could be a broader thing right like I just I don't know don't yeah. believe in x yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna have you go take y instead um the relief is the statutory relief of course objection is alternate plan of instruction you create approved by the principal mm -hmm. it is not to like if you like this comes up a lot in sex ed so instead of having someone come in and say, I don't think anybody should have sex ed, you have an alternative plan during sex ed that you do at a different time and you work with the teacher on. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. And I personally don't think that I would ever need to use this particular remedy, but the remedy is available now. And I don't know what the optics look like when we're actually excluding that remedy away from the course curriculum. Right. So if someone is unhappy with a book that's actually being used inside of a social studies class, to use your example. Right now, what we're doing is the only remedy they have is the exclusion of their child. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Which is the new policy. That's the statute. The old policy yeah, was you can go through. You can go through these steps. Uh, you can question. You can meet with the superintendent. You could, you know, appeal to the school board. Like that step yeah. is available today. What we're doing is we're removing that on all things curriculum. I think we're granting something beyond what the statute. Yes, is. I agree. Yeah. And I prefer to stick to for this a strict. 
Well, because I would hate to have the appeal that the student is they're not, either. it's not a right that exists. We're creating a right that doesn't exist under the law. Well, but right now we are giving them the right. Now we're we, taking it away. That's so right. That's my concern. So fair. It, it's not that I think it's something that should never, and I think you're right. I think the statute is the piece that we, we are there, but I want to make sure that we at least had that conversation so people mm -hmm. understand fundamentally what we're trying to do because I didn't see that represented anywhere in the minutes from well, the I can tell you that the discussion that we had about this or with okay. mandate and policy it was quite robust. Yes. Um the first attempt was to make the, the way it was written, the spirit of it was intended to be maintained. Um and because it included library resources and uh course material instructional materials the idea was to define that as the instructional materials, capital I, capital M, library and course materials. Then, but other places in the in the policy that required other changes. So there was like um, one place where it was only the library media specialist was responsible for something. So the question was, well, who's then responsible for the course materials? It can't be the library. Not all of this falls on the librarian. It was like, then, like course materials then, were interspersed at places that didn't really make yeah, sense. Yes, so then it was then talking with the administration, like, oh, well, course it's materials, hold on, time out. Course it. materials are handled differently. It's course material objections is basically what Steve just said. So we're like, oh, well, then if we already have a policy and there's a, there's a pathway for those objections, then why are we trying to stuff that into here at this appeal natural anymore? We couldn't make those harmonization changes, we said, okay, well, let's separate the two issues. Let's say the library is its own box and it has its own process for objection. That's this policy. Course materials is a whole different matter altogether. And it has its own place and it has its own policy for that. Now, whether we wanna have a discussion to your point about providing more rights that are, that are by statute, probably is within our power to, to grant more rights, I, I presume, I don't know. Well, we could have that discussion, but I think just in, your, in one's mind, it's easier to implement that you have the library policy separate from the other instructions. Well, I'm policy. absolutely okay with the bifurcation of the two. It makes all the sense in the world. It's just right now we're removing or restricting a parent's right based on the way the new policy is written that we're going to adopt tonight. Because right now the current policy affords them more opportunity um, to, to participate right. in that process. And so if we can add that also to the list, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. So do you are you are you saying, Stephen, that you're comfortable going ahead and moving forward with approving this is just a first read? Or would you rather hold off and us have a further discussion at the next meeting about this before we do an approval? We're not going to have a next meeting before the next policy. The next policy is going to be May or right. Uh, but but is it so, something that we as a school would want to have a, a more robust conversation? I believe, we have a personally, from my perspective, I believe it's more important to have these policies in place and updated okay. and refreshed and on file. So if we have an issue, we can go immediately to it. Okay. And I think when we go ahead at our policy committee and have that robust discussion about should we continue to afford that that access point mm -hmm. to the, the avenues of remedy uh, to our curriculum component. I think the community deserves to know that it was properly vetted, discussed, and articulated in terms of the why or the why. Like a review of IGE once policy reconvenes yep. to, to see, you yeah. know, should we need to cut and paste the portion see. of our existing now new library policy. Right. Into the curriculum. And, and arguably just a different process too, right? Okay. Because you might have, Different people, when you're trying to decide, is a is a material appropriate for a specific learning purpose? Yeah. Um, you know, then, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I don't. I'm just thinking out loud. But you know, is it is it a student who has taken that class or is enrolled in that class who should be sitting in, or as opposed to a freshman who's not going to take a course? I mean, how you know if if if, if that's the representative yeah. on the board? So should the committee even look different when you're talking about a review of instructional material versus a review of this material that's kind of open to everyone? I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So you have that list. I do. It's on my list. All right. Yeah. Okay. Julie Great. Right. In a positive way. And that's a good point. Yeah, it is a good point. And I appreciate that. Action item. Tag on. Great. Thank you. Um, any other policies that people have questions on? Okay. Um, can I have a motion? Is there one that you wanted to approve right away? Do we want that discussion first? Or? I believe that's JCA. 
I would move to waive the requirement for a second reading is policy J C A. And that's a change of class that's for change. school assignment best interest. Yep. I will second that. Okay, that's for a second uh discussion on why you would like to um, the reasons I stated earlier, RSA 193 3 was um modified during it was the last legislative session, but recently uh in effect, and I think it's important that we have a policy that is consistent with the, those changes made by the legislature. Any uh, questions or discussion around that? Nope, seeing none, then I will ask for a vote. Those in favor of uh, waiving the first second. read. Yeah, waiving, right. waiving the second read and, and approving done. this tonight. Well, it's two separate motions, right? right. We have to do one yeah, do, one do is the, to do the one to read, read. Yes. first, first and second. Yes. So let's do just the motion, the motion to wait just a second. Okay, that passes by zero. And I'll make a motion that we pass policy JCA. That's read. As read. That's read. And second. Second. Any discussion around that? Those in favor? That's five. None opposed. All right. And then a motion to oh, we don't have to do anything. The other one's our first read. The others just go on automatically, right? Okay. Yeah. We need a motion to move them to Correct. second read. Okay. And let's move on. Okay, the safe grants. That is um, information we're going to discuss more in non public because it regards security of the school, but it is money that has recently come in. Mm -hmm. Amy, is there anything you want to address on that now, or do you want to? Yeah. I mean, there's not much we can say other than you know, I mean, uh, it's grant money that came in. That and so, the, so there, there's some information that's available on the, on the state website, right? So, there's three categories it's alerting. It's okay. controlled access. So this is under the alerting category. It just increases our ability to alert. It's not double secret probation. Um, yeah. This is just, if you want to go deeper than that, but this increases, enhances our ability to alert um, the school community. Yes. And um, I have a question, a comment to share about that. Yes. Yeah. That is perfectly publicable. Publicable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, can we use it to pay for our repeaters? Because uh, that for sure is a, enhances our ability to communicate. Because before we didn't have a cell signal here, and now we do. Right. So remember, it's, it's supplanting. So we we submitted a specific request that was approved specifically for this. Oh, for that's project specific. It's project yeah, specific yes. for a little. Oh, I see. So it was money that was um, we were told was going to be made available. This was round three of the state grants, um, and we were given a uh, specific time on a specific day to log in. It was first come, first serve. Wow. Uh, so Roger and I prepared and we were ready at 10 a.m. with all of our projects. And we there's a number of, of um, projects and districts that are on the waiting list. So we were very pleased that uh, what they did is they, they accepted all the, the round two folks who didn't receive money and then they went to first come, first serve. So. So we got ours in, and um, actually in the FCU 39, all of the districts received the, our, the full allocation um, nice. of funding at each of the buildings. Well done. So we had well done. Yeah. strong quotes. So we had discussions from the security level of what, what would the next iteration be. Yeah. We had bids ready. Roger and Amy had bids ready, logged in, and hit it. Yeah. Um, and so in a very specific project, hit that category and it was approved, and we need authorization for the board chair. To sign the agreement yeah. and the suit. Yeah, that's the question yeah. I was going to ask if we want to just do any discussion on public because we are going to need a motion that yeah, it's signed. Yeah, it needs yeah. to be signed yeah, yeah. Um, by April 5th. Mm -hmm. Next board meeting is April 4th. So that's why it was right. a last minute ad. Um, we got to do it. Yeah, and then we, we actually need to have the, the funds covered by the end of this fiscal year and the project complete by um, the end of the calendar year. So, um, so we're going to be busy with all these projects over the next few months. but. So I just want to ask, are, are people comfortable just making a motion to allow me to sign for this, or would you rather to have discussion on public first and we can come out? I would just say, let's have the discussion. We have to go in a non-public okay. anyway. Yes, we We're going to have to come out of non-public and make motions anyway. Yeah. So that's all right. Yeah. And it's in the Trello the information also. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, then we are on to any updates from Superintendent Barry. This was a request we added on from last meeting that we 
there were any updates yeah, for him, any questions that we might, if there's any outstanding things that we can address. And also, was it direct before you start, Mike? I'm sorry, but it also enables us to to dive into the board notes um, if, if there's one or two. Yeah. Well, that was the primary reason. I, that's what I was going to talk about. So I'm not sure. We have an agenda item. We could talk to you about it. There were issues or questions. Or... Yeah. And this evening, I don't have any additional updates for you guys. So if there's questions on the general updates from the board notes, I'm happy to speak to them if, if you'd like. Uh, I, I, I do. So thank you. Yeah. Um, a couple things. The skylight replacement, right? So we've been talking about this now since. April, May of last year. Um, has there been an attempt to seek a waiver from the fire marshal on the obligation to get an architecture approved? It was not a like yeah, not. Fire marshal of the state of New Hampshire. Oh, sorry. Uh, Local. Yeah. And I think he, he was in touch with, with the board. So there, there's an appeal process to that. And the reason being is because, from my understanding, it never really worked. So why are we replacing it if it never worked? Um, from, from the get-go. And the life safety components of this building, the capacity components, the way we've modified the building, I think the circumstances have changed. And I think we've got a justifiable um, argument to the state fire marshal to say, hey, listen, this is costing us a lot of money now, uh, a lot more than just a simple replacement of this. Um, with the, this town has a multiple million dollar tower truck so they can clearly go up and vent uh, the roof if, if there is a circumstance. Uh, the life safety components of the building with the many egresses and ingresses. Like there's a structure in place to say, hey, we don't need to spend the type of money and wait as long as we have because our roofs are not leaking, causing more damage. Um, so I think that's something that is, is really worth exploring uh, is to say, hey, state fire marshal, we want to appeal the local decision about the fire marshal's decision. Um, I, 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 I think that at least we should have that conversation and discussion. I will work on that. Yeah. The other thing is, is, I'm very happy to see the driver's ed sort of RFP in there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I love the fact that we're putting it out for bid and allowing other providers to go in there. Um, the, the start and end time discussion, before we actually discuss that at our SAU meeting, if we can go ahead and resurvey the same set of questions that we did last year to the community, um, because I want to be able to track the cadence uh, over multiple years in terms of feedback from them. I know that's going to be some heavy lifting, but it, I think Kristen did an awesome job crafting those questions. That's what she did for a living. And I think those questions really resonate with parents. And more importantly, I think they were honest. And if we're able to capture that same data set, to see if there's actually any shift or move from a parent perspective, a student perspective, and a teacher perspective, we can see if we can start to actually track that. Yeah, that's the intention. Um... You know, we are uh, following the vote on March 12th when we're conducting a survey around start times um, using questions from previous years. And uh, so we're, that's in process. Awesome. That's all I have. I want to thank you for the uh, board report. It's great. I'd like to echo that board report, the board notes, and just all the stuff you're putting on Trello, the background documents, you know, that's, I really want to applaud you for that. It's, um, it's, it's evidence of the sharing of information. I think we can do more of it. I, it really gives an opportunity for us to have more meaningful discussions when we come to this setting. So please keep that up. No, I, I appreciate the acknowledgement of it. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate the amount of people that go put into creating the agendas each week for and we do this yet every week, you know, virtually. So this, you know, this amount of work is done. And uh for this particular for South Egan, South Egan is pretty complicated. There's a lot happening. And uh, for us to kind of move at a pace that we would like to move and keep everyone informed uh as we as we continue to do the work in, in different uh you know uh, departments. Uh, it is a, a time-consuming endeavor, so I do appreciate the acknowledgement. I know the people at this table do, as well as uh, Danae and Chelsea uh, throughout the week as we work. It's Roger and Brian. It's it's a full SAU level. And then, uh, of course, with uh, the building administration, those principal reports, those are, are very time-consuming. And I lived a life where I could do them poorly as a principal 
and that was fine. And, and we know that's not in existing, but they are they are very time consuming to do well. And uh, so Dana and her team put together a very good principal report. So I uh, appreciate that with this, and, uh, a lot of good effort into it. And uh, so thank you. Okay. Motion to go into non-public? No, we're gonna have yeah, public, public input too. Oh yeah, public input. Right. <clears throat> Any input? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so Tom Gothier from Amherst. Um, I, I want to, I'll start this off with, I hope that uh, the discussion of your science labs tonight will, and the impact funds that will go towards this can finally put to bed the question of seventh and eighth grade moving to the South Eden Cooperative. Um, we've put this forward several times before the whys of why we don't want to do this, but to repeat them, uh, Amherst School Board, no interest. Administration, it's not best educationally for kids. It doesn't solve space issues in our district. It moves them simply from point A to point B, maybe to point C. It doesn't solve aging facility and watertight issues at Clark, Wilkins, AMS, or South Keegan. It doesn't plan for the forced migration of dozens of staff members from one teaching union to another. Mont Vernon has not ex expressed an interest in this, nor the Amherst community until little birdies started whispering in ears. Even then, the outcry from these birdies and their whisperees has been very, very minimal. Of course, we all remember in this room that there was an SAU 39 district-wide consolidation study years ago, four or five years ago now. Stephen O'Keefe was involved in this, and that plan seemed to be about as popular as a kick in the face. All of that said, my main point in making this comment tonight is to provide a little more context to one sentence that seems to be keeping this alive. And that was back on September 11th. This board voted not to pursue seventh and eighth grade unless approached by another district. So paraphrasing those last five words. That would seem to make it seem like Sauhegan is interested in this, ready to fling the doors wide open if Amherst wasn't so intransigent. I would encourage folks to go back and look at this meeting and listen to the fine print. After presenting a lengthy room utilization study that filled up about probably 40 minutes of that meeting, at 118, one hour, 18 minutes, Mr. Bayou said that looking at room count is not a way to predict seventh and eighth grade viability because not all rooms are actually classroom ready. He said it would mean shovels in the ground and or portables. At various times, Mr. Bayou and Mr. O'Keefe both indicated interest in an automotive CTE program in the annex, something that they had heard from community members. At 122, Ms. Goulet Zimmerman said that bringing 7th and 8th grade over would mean repurposing more than a dozen rooms from your overall study to viable classroom space. This means repurposing rooms like gym, conference room, library, weight room, store, tech support, etc., all to shoehorn one building's kids, one district's kids into another building. At 132, Mr. O'Keefe said doing a migration severely limits the space available for Sauhegan programming. We see that tonight with study of labs that need to be properly updated. At 159, Mr. O'Keefe added that Mont Vernon is still not ready for this discussion and does not foresee that happening in the near future. At 145, Ms. Grun said filling this building to the brim isn't viable long term because, quote, full capacity breaks. She also added that it seems irresponsible to shrink the Sauhegan programming to accommodate another district's students. At 156, and Mr. O'Keefe commented on the eloquence of this statement from Ms. Peters, she said that she was frustrated, this keeps coming up, and that the board would task Ms. Curran with the job of reviewing how to teach another district's kids rather than creating the best educational experience for South Hegan students, the job for which she was hired last summer. And then at the two-hour mark, Ms. Goulet Zimmerman reiterated based on your own building studies that you don't have the space without an addition. So looking at all of those examples, it's clear that this board's goals, rightfully so, are to serve South Hegan students to the best of its ability, providing the best education experiences, life experiences, and overall preparation for life. And that should be this board's goals. Tom, we're just at three minutes. Just like yep, I have 30 seconds left. Sure. So I will commend you for expanding and improving your science labs for your students, while also focusing on the future town housing projects and population growth, and how South Hegan can be best prepared to meet these challenges. This is what Amherst has tried to do for many years now. Again, strong headwinds, sometimes from the most peculiar of places. I hope that this diatribe and a rewatch of that video on September 11th can put to bed once and for all this entire question, but I'm certainly not optimistic for it. I would also encourage the majority of this board to publicly reiterate that its mission is a focus on South Hegan students, said by five members of the board that night, and to officially dismiss this lingering notion put forth by a minority of this board that you're open for business as soon as other districts see the light. Thank you.
Can I just yeah, provide for the record references for people to what he's quoting for? I'm not going to comment on it. I'm just going to say that anyone who is watching this who is interested in getting more details or the um, video that uh, Mr. Gothier is referring to, it is on the YouTube page for SAU 39 dated 9 11 2023, and the minutes and agenda are on the website at the same location. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody online, Mr. Chamberlain? There was one person online, but there is no hand raised. No hand raised. We'll give them just a moment to see if they raise their hand. And if not, we will move into non public. I okay, move to go into okay. non public. Uh, well, our, under RSA 91, that's the RSA 91A32 AC and I. Right. Yeah, we're going to. Second. Moment. Uh, and uh, yes. we'll call the yes. wait, A, C, I, and B, the hiring of a person of a public employee, right? Uh, we're not hiring, we're... Oh. We'll do C, reputation. Yeah. Reputation. Okay. Just making sure I've got yeah. it right. A, C, I. A, C, I. All right. All right. Mr. Lover, yes. Delay Zerman, yes. 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 Yes.